I want to pick up where I left off a couple of weeks ago, um, becoming my true self, the true you, it is a process. It's a process of partnering with God. And for a lot of us, we've taken on false ideas of who we are, false identities, if you will. And we've created these personas uh, based on our experience, the things that have happened to us in our lives, the things that people have said to us and spoken over us. And then, of course, we have the enemy of our soul, the devil, uh, who the Bible calls the accuser of the brethren, which will jump on all of our failures, all of our sin, and will get in your ear, uh, just like, you know, in the cartoons, the little devil on your shoulder, trying to tell you who you are and who you're not. And if we listen to those lives, we wouldn't even be at church today because you would have not walked through these doors because you believe that you're, you're too far gone. Like we sang today, you're, you're a sinner. You're too far gone. There's too much guilt. There's too much shame. And, and yet the Spirit of God says, for there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For what the law was powerless to do, Christ did. And so aren't you so grateful that we got to celebrate communion and remind ourselves this morning of what Christ did. And today I want to pick up in Galatians chapter 7. I'm just going to read it from the screen for the sake of time. Galatians chapter um, 6, rather, verses 7 through 9. And it says this, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. And let me pause there for a second and remind ourselves that Paul was speaking in an agriculture culture. And Jesus oftentimes would use parables, short stories, to explain uh, spiritual truths and principles. And he would oftentimes use parables, short stories about farmers and farming and sowing. And Paul would continue on that theme with these few verses to the Galatians. Uh, in verse 8, he says, whoever sows, in other words, who plants, sowing is planting, whoever plants to please their flesh, from the flesh they will reap destruction. But whoever sows or plants to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. And here's the verse, um, verse 9, that I really want us to hone in on this morning. And it's this, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. I want to read it one more time, if I could, if you could keep it up on the screen. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this time that we have. My time is short. I pray that you would give me a grace to unpack what you've put on my heart to share with your people today. Father, I ask for your anointing to preach your word. God, I am nothing without you. So we give this time to you. Holy Spirit, we say this is your time. It's your church. Would you have your way in all of us? God, I pray that you would open up every heart, every ear, every eye, every mind, to receive exactly what you have for them today. God, we are not here by chance. We are not here by circumstance. We are here by divine appointment. So have your way and have your will. Let it be done today as in, on earth as it is in heaven, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to talk to you about the undaunted soul. The undaunted soul. We've been talking about soul sabotage. And I firmly believe that for many of us, the, the growth process, the process of change, the process of transformation, um, the process of becoming the true you, who God made you to be, not what others tell you to be, not what you've believed about yourself, not what your past experience is trying to tell you who you are, but becoming the true you, it, it takes time. Theologically, this is called the sanctification process or discipleship process. And, and we live in this culture of fast food. You know, have it your way, have it right now. We live in a microwave society in our 2024 culture where we want fast food Christianity. We want to be able to come to church in an hour and get out and we, we want to shortchange God. And I personally believe that a lot of our problem is we don't give God enough time to do the work that he wants to and needs to do in us. Let me tell you something. Our sin runs deep. Our guilt, our shame runs deep. Our wounds, our brokenness, our failures, they run deep in us. And who are we to think that we can get zapped or have a microwave change to that, that deep wounding 
those scars are going to heal overnight. No, this is a process. In fact, turn to your neighbor and say, this might take a little while. <laughs> it's going to take a little while. Like this just doesn't, just doesn't happen like overnight. And so I believe that we need to be undaunted. We need to learn to have an undaunted soul. And you might be wondering, what, what does undaunted mean? I have a little uh, definition for you, if you guys can put that up. Um, undaunted means to courageously resolute, to be courageously resolute in the face of danger, difficulty, or discouragement. Not afraid to continue doing something or trying to do something, even though there are problems or dangers. I love that. Yeah. Courageously resolute, especially in the face of danger, difficulty, or discouragement. Now, Jesus would speak to this in John 16, 13. I love this in the Amplified Classic Version. He would say this in preparation for his disciples, the ones that he loved. He knew that he was going to be going to the cross. He knew that he was going to leave them. And yet he was trying to prepare them for his departure. And he had been with them for about two years and they, they got to experience amazing things in his presence. They were taught at the feet of Jesus. They got to lean into his chest and to get to hear his heartbeat and to see his heart for people. They got to see amazing miracles. And yet Jesus knew something, that they're going to face trouble. And this is what he said. He said, I have told you these things. Listen, everything that I've told you, I've told you these things so that in me, you may have perfect peace. I love that. Perfect peace. Not just any peace. Perfect peace and confidence. In this world, you will have tribulation and trials and distress and frustration. Come on. Anybody right now going through any trials, temptations, distress, or frustrations? Come on, right? It's a part of life, people. And yet we have been so conditioned by the world to avoid any type of uncomfortability. Any kind of pain is bad. So we need to do everything in our power. Think about how many decisions that we make in life are built on shielding ourselves from being uncomfortable or not experiencing pain. And yet Jesus is saying, it's impossible. In this world, you're gonna have, you're gonna go through some stuff. You're gonna go through trials. You're gonna go through temptations. You're gonna go through distress and frustration. But here's the good news but be of good cheer. Some translations say, take heart. In fact, uh, the word heart uh, is rooted in the Latin word core. It's where we get the word courage just from. And so when Jesus is saying, like, take heart, let your heart be of good cheer. Let your heart be encouraged. Come on, if there's anything that I think the enemy of your soul wants to do to sabotage your spiritual life and growth, is to have you be in a constant state of discouragement. Now, he's smart. He's got a plan. He's got the schemes. In fact, Peter would say, be aware of the schemes of the enemy. And let me tell you, one of the greatest schemes of the enemy is discouragement in our lives. He knows, like, he doesn't have to tempt you to look at porn. He doesn't have to tempt you to cheat on your husband or your wife. He, he doesn't have to tempt you to fall in any big sin, although he'll try to. But for a lot of us, we're not going to fall into that. That's too easy. We know that. But for many of us, the subtleness of discouragement creeps into our lives. And, and if we're not careful, when we embark on this journey of transformation with Jesus, we, we see the promises. It's like there's this, we're standing on a mountain and there's a valley in between and there's a peak on the other side and we know God has called us to get there. We know that's where his promise is. But there's this gap between the promise and perfection. And, and that word perfection might throw some of you off. Simply put, in the New Testament, when you see the word perfect, and for all of us perfectionists, this is going to really mess with you, okay? And, I, and I'm a recovering perfectionist, right? I want everything perfect. I have to try to avoid. I come into church and I see this light is out and this isn't just right and, and that. And I got to... 
pull it together, Lance. It's all about Jesus. Like, right? I need to remember that. It's not about being perfect. I'll get mad at myself if I've ever got to say something to you in my message that I had in my notes. And I'll, I'll look at him after and be like, oh, darn it. That was so good. And yet I forgot it. And then I just got to trust that God gave me what he gave me and that I'm just speaking by the power of his Holy Spirit what needs to be said and leave the rest to him. But for our perfectionists, that word might mess with you. But let me unpack it for you, what it really means. To be perfect simply means to be complete. Like something that was unfinished is now finished. It's complete. Completion is a process. Therefore, perfection is a process. A process. I am not perfect yet. In fact, I am far from it. But I am in process of becoming perfected. I am in the process. This is, this is the essence of salvation. So we don't get this. One of the words for salvation is the word sozo in the original Greek language. And that word means not just to be saved, like we celebrated our salvation. That's one of the things I love about communion is we remind ourselves, we remember what Jesus did. This is the foundation for our faith. Faith. This is the good news, right? That we celebrate that, but it doesn't stop there. And this is part of the problem with the American church, I believe, is for many of us, that's where we stop. And that, we were never meant to stop at salvation. Salvation is the beginning of the journey, not the end. Yeah. God didn't save you just so you could go to heaven. He saved you so that you could become who he made you to be, so you could do the good works that he planned for you yeah. and me long ago. God has a purpose, and he has a plan for your life. And yet, for many of us, we get discouraged because we see the gap between where I am and where God has called me to be. And can I tell you, here is what I believe the key to going from where we are to where God wants us to be. And it's this word called perseverance. Between the promise and perfection is perseverance. Now, for many of us, in fact, a lot of the um, saints of old, St. John of the Cross, uh, a lot of the old saints, they they recognize something that I think is important. And that is that at some point in your Christian journey, and it is a journey, and this journey takes a while, but some point in our Christian journey, all of us hit a wall. We hit a wall. Our expectations of what God and hopes of what God would do and who we would become usually don't happen sooner. We think, and, and this happens practically all the time. We start out the new year, right? And we're gung-ho. In fact, uh, I'm, I'm enjoying it because this was one of the first years that I had been going to the gym consistently before January. And so this year when I showed up in January and saw all the new people there, I'm like, poor suckers. Yeah, yeah I've been here all along, you know? But I'm like, I'm going to keep being consistent. And it was annoying quite frankly, because I'd go and I couldn't do my routine in the normal time because there's so many people on different stations and I had to wait for my station to get open to do my exercise and blah, 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 blah. But I'll tell you right now, I can go in and pretty much get my routine done because all those people already trickled out. But here's part of the problem with change. It takes a while. And because it takes a while, too many of us give up too soon. We abort the process because we don't see the change that we want to happen in our lives. So practically speaking, back to my analogy, here's what happens. You go to the gym for 30 days and you lost one pound. One pound, people. And you look in the mirror and you want bulging, huge biceps and they might have grown, if you're really positive, they might have grown by that much. And so we worked really hard. I was really consistent. I went to the gym. I went to the gym. I went to the gym. And I don't see the change. And too many of us say, this just doesn't work. I remember one time I was talking to a guy, and um, I told him I was a pastor. And, you know, that's always an interesting conversation, whether you're on a plane or somewhere. Um, I've learned that I don't, I don't put that out there right away. Because as soon as you put that out, people, you know, they stop cussing and, you know, they stop watching R-rated movies on their iPad or whatever. Um, and they kind of, you know, get themselves together like, you know, oh, it's a pastor. I got to, I got to do that. You know, I got to watch myself. And so I wait till later and then give them the big reveal. <laughs> and they're like, oh, shoot. Then you can see it going through their mind. What did I say? <laughs> so anyway, we get into conversations and, and, and about Christianity oftentimes. And I remember this one guy said, yeah, I tried that. 
didn't work. I said, really? I said, tell me about that. Like, what did you try? He's like, well, you know, I went to church once or twice. I said, okay. Did you read your Bible at all? Yeah, you know, I tried to read it, but it didn't really make a whole lot of sense to me, so not really. I'm like, did you try any kind of devotional time where you actually spent time with God and asked him to open up your heart? And try? No, you know, I, it, I didn't really have time for that. And I said, bro, you, you didn't really try Christianity. Christianity isn't just trying, it's surrendering. And I said, until you're ready to surrender your life, so that you could receive his life, you're going to miss the whole point. So we had this interesting conversation, but it it reminds me, for too many of us, we try to change. We try, we hope, you know, I want my marriage to be better. So I tried a few things, didn't work. My wife's still nagging, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I'm telling you, we give up way too easy. In fact, culture just feeds into this idea to us that we shouldn't have to work hard. Shoot, I don't even have to make dinner anymore. I just Uber eats it, right? And next thing you know, DoorDash, I got somebody knocking on my door. Here's your dinner. We don't have to work for anything. Everything comes easy. And so what it does is it conditions us to think that I should have it my way, like life should be easy. And we try to insulate ourselves from anything that would cause us pain. But look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 36 says this. You need to, what? Persevere. There's that word. There's the gap between the promise and the perfection. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what was promised. Listen, there's so many of us in this room right now, maybe even those of you watching online, I have them in my life. There are things that God has spoken to your heart personally, things you've written down in a journal, verses in your Bible you've underlined, prophecies, prophetic words that God has spoken over your life that you have believed for. Some of us have believed for years. And we believe that's the promise that God's given me. But somewhere between the promise and the perfection, we get lost in the gap. We fall through the crack and we give up. And the Bible is full of examples of this. I, I love the example of Abraham. Abraham had this amazing promise from God that even though he was old and his wife was old and it was impossible for them to have children, God took him out of his tent one day and said, see the stars? You're going to have children, as many stars as you can see. That's how many descendants you're going to be. And he gave him this promise And I can imagine Abraham like wrestling with that inside, trying to reconcile it. But I'm old and like, how's this supposed to work? And they haven't even invented Viagra yet. And so God, how are you gonna do this thing? There was this gap, right? And then there were years, 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 people. Not days, not weeks like we want it to be. Not months, years of waiting for the promise. Until one day, They said, you know what? I don't know where God is in the perfection of this promise, but we're going to take things in our own hands. We're going to make this promise work, doggone it. We're going to come up, and out of their flesh, they came up with their own plan to try to make what God said he was going to do happen. And for many of us, that's a trap that we could fall into too, that, you know, I don't know where we are in the process of receiving the promises God has, but You know, I'm going to make this thing happen. I'm going to take my life into my own hands. I'm going to try to make it happen in my own strength. And that would be a mistake. But we all hit these walls. We hit walls. We hit ceilings in our growth. We run into closed doors. There are times and seasons in in our lives where, man, once we were spiritually alive and now we just, we come to a worship service just like we did and other people are weeping, they're worshiping, they're crying. And you're like, man, where's my heart? I don't feel God. I don't sense his presence. I'm I'm in a season of dryness. We can become disillusioned with God, with church, with what this is all about. Why am I here? And outside, we put on the smile. We do the stuff. But inside, we're empty and we're hurting. And it's time that we got real with God and ourselves and understand that in this world, you will run into walls. You will hit ceilings. You'll walk into closed doors. In Jesus' words, you will have trouble. 
But take heart. He has overcome the world. Jesus is greater than any wall, any ceiling, any closed door. And I believe that in those seasons where we feel dry, we feel empty, we feel like we've tried and we're about to give up, maybe we already have given up. Maybe there's some of those promises that the Holy Spirit would remind some of you this morning of. It was interesting, yesterday um, and Friday night, we had uh, some of our prayer team, ministry team and intercessors uh, went through and some of our leaders went through a process with our good friend, Kirk Curlin. Thank you, sir. And your team, Dave, is Dave with you? He left. He left, but thank you very much, sir. But it took us through uh, ministry training. And part of that ministry training is them, it's called the tune. And it's tuning in to the Holy Spirit and the voice of God. And because you have to get trained in that. We don't naturally do that. We have to work at that. We have to tune ourselves in. God is always speaking. I firmly believe that. He's always speaking to us. Just like right now, there's frequency waves going on. You can't see them. They're invisible. But if you took a transistor radio and you tuned into a certain frequency, you would hear what was being said over that frequency. I believe that there is a God frequency, not to get confused with that weird other God frequency. Don't Google it. Just forget it. Um, this is why I do it for you, okay, as your pastor, so you don't have to get tripped up on it. Um, but all of us can tune into the voice of God. And, and it was interesting. I asked Pastor David, hey, how's it going? And he said, well, there, there was a lot of prophetic words that people received that were given 20 years ago. And I said, how fitting that God would remind those people of words that he had spoken, promises that he had given them 20 years ago, that he would bring them back to remembrance. And it, it reminded me today to, that I believe one of the things the Holy Spirit wants to do in us today is he wants to remind some of you of the promises that he's spoken to you specifically over yourself, over your marriage, over your family, and to believe for it again. But here's the thing that we have to understand. Spiritual growth and maturity in Christ requires perseverance. It requires it. It is not an option. It absolutely requires us to be undeterred in our determination that I will align my will with God's will. I'm gonna say it one more time, and you need to write this down and you need to remember it because you will at some point, maybe you're in a good season right now, but at some point I guarantee you this, you're gonna hit a wall, you're gonna hit a ceiling, you're gonna run into a closed door. And during those times, we need to remember, and the question that we, sh we usually ask is, God, what are you doing? Like, in my circumstances, but the question that we should be asking ourselves is, God, what do you want to do in me? Because I guarantee you that everything that we go through, God is trying to work for our good, for those who love him and are called, and you are called according to his purposes. James would say it like this, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Why? Because you know, and you need to know this. You need to unequivocally know this. And this is why we can, that verse always just messed with me. I don't know about you. Maybe I'm weird, but I'm like, James, really? You're so holier than thou. You are such a spiritual giant that when you go through trials, you're just like, ha, 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 devil. I got this. It's all good. I got joy. You start singing, I got joy, 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 deep in my heart. Remember that song? Yeah. Anyone? Okay, I'm the only one. But I, I read this verse and it messes with me. Why? Because how do you have joy facing trials? Who does that? Weird people do that. You know? What are you, sadistic? No. James isn't sadistic. He understood something. It's a spiritual truth that you and I absolutely unequivocally have to understand. That because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, your faith has to be tested. It has to be tested. Why? Because you need to know it's real. You need to know you can count on it. You need to know that you can trust God when you're in the middle of trials. Yeah. That God is working. Yeah. God's word isn't dead. It's alive. It's sharp. It's active. And he is working behind the scenes of our life. He's an on-time God. And whether we see it or not, whether we feel it or not, I have to stand in faith believing that my God is working. 
And the greatest work that he's doing is the work in me. And if we don't have perseverance, check this out. This is what happens. Verse 4. Let perseverance finish. That word is teleos. It's the word perfect. It is the word complete. Let perseverance be perfected. It's work so that you may be mature. And here it is again, complete, not lacking anything. Do you see that? Perseverance is the key to spiritual growth and maturity. We cannot allow discouragement. We cannot allow our feelings. We cannot allow our problems and our circumstances and our trials that we're going through to keep us stuck in the gap between the promise and the perfection. Because in the middle, if we will persevere, if we will steadfast, hang on to the truth of God, keep in front of you who God says you are, what he's told you he will do, no matter what, I'm going to stand on God's word, believing it in faith that even though I don't see it, even though I don't feel it, I know God will do it. And here's the problem. For many of us, this is where God is trying us to lose our grip on control and power. It is, it is where God breaks us of our self-will so that we could yield to his will. And so here's, a, I got a couple things and I'm gonna go through them very quickly for you. These are the handles here. Because you might be like, okay, Pastor Lance, perseverance, I get it. I, 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 want, I want that, I need that, I, I get that. But how do, how, do I get, how do I get perseverance? It's not something you go to the store and buy. It's something that you allow God to do in you that you partner with God. So here's, here's principle number one. There's some things that I believe that we need to choose. And the first one is this. Choose to control what's in your control and let go of what's not. I know. This preaches a lot better and a lot easier than it is to actually walk it out and do it. But our problem is we want to control everything, Right? I know some of you control freaks, some of you are hover moms, right? You want to control your kids, you want to control your life, you want to insulate yourself from, you know, any kind of pain. But the problem is we are not in control. Let that sink in for a minute, people. And I think the reality of that happens when we go through trials, right? You get a health scare, you get a phone call in the middle of the night. And what we realize is, man, my life is really not in my control. But there are some things that are in my control. And there's some things that aren't. And so just like um, in AA, one of, the, one of the things that they teach people, the way to break addiction is understanding what is in my control and what's in God's, con- in, in his hands, right? And all of us have to learn this. Like, I don't have control over, listen, let me tell I'm going to speak to the heart of some of you right now. Some of you have gone through some terrible things in your life. Some of you have experienced trauma, pain, abuse. Some of you have gone through some divorce. Some of you were abandoned as children. Some of you for years have been tormented by anxiety or depression, suicidal thoughts. But can I tell you something that you need to hear? As hard as your past may have been, as painful, how, as how, those wounds, they run so deep, but God's grace runs so much deeper. And at some point, and I've had to do this, I'm not just up here speaking to you, some pastors had a perfect life. I'm speaking to you as somebody who's had to let go of things in my past. You are not a victim. My Bible says you're a victor in Christ. And so you have to learn to let go of what is out of your control. You couldn't control what happened to you. You couldn't. It's not your fault. But what you can control is what you hold on to and what you let go of. And I'm encouraging to you to work this out with God and know the difference between what happened to you that you couldn't control. Take responsibility for what you could and work that out with God too. 
but then look at your life and say, I am not going to continue to live in a state of victimhood like I don't have a choice. Because you always have a choice. You may not be able to choose what happened to you, but you get to choose your future. You get to choose what you do with what's happened to you. And I'm telling you to let go of it and give it to God and watch what he can do. The second thing we need to choose is this. Choose the pain of perseverance over the pain of regret. Amen. Choose the pain of perseverance over the pain of regret. Perseverance is painful. It is. There's no way around it. I know we don't like pain. I love, uh, you know, you've, everybody's heard, this is a common phrase you hear in the gym, no pain, no gain, Right? And I love, um, I love what one pastor said. Uh, his name is escaping me, but he, he, said, uh, he said, no pain, no pain. <laughs> He's like, that's what I like. No pain, no pain. That's what we all like. We don't like pain, right? And I get it. I don't like pain either. But let me tell you something. Just like Paul said, he says, I didn't want to be here in prison. I didn't, I didn't want to be here in prison but now that I see how God is using my pain for his purpose, he says, I choose the chains. Can I tell you something? You get to choose your pain. And you either choose the pain of perseverance or the pain of regret. And let me tell you, the pain of regret is so much more. The pain of perseverance is nothing compared to the pain of regret. I'll say it like this. Perseverance is painful. Regret is more painful. And you get to choose. Hebrews 12, 11 says this, no discipline, okay? This is perseverance. You gotta discipline yourself with the power of the Holy Spirit enabling you to be disciplined in your perseverance. The writer of Hebrews, Paul, he knew something about this. He says, no discipline seems pleasant at the time. It's, but, it's, but, it's painful. Paul's saying, listen, this is painful. Me becoming who God really made me to be, letting go of my past, taking responsibility for what I'm supposed to be responsible for, letting go of control, and letting God have his way in me is painful. It is. But listen what happens if you'll do it. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been, what? Trained by it. Remember last time we were together, I talked to you about the difference between trying and training. And that if we'll look at our becoming our true selves in Christ, we're in training, right? We're not trying, I'm in training. Training means sometimes I fail. Sometimes I don't get it. But I don't stay there. I get back up, I brush myself off because I realize God is doing something in my life. Therefore, if I fail, I'm failing forward. I'm not failing, I'm learning. I'm not just failing, I'm growing. I love what Sam Shan says. He's, a, he's a, a kingdom leadership guru. He says this, often, listen to this, often the difference between where I am and where God wants me to be is the pain I am unwilling to endure. Let that sink in. So here's the question. Will you choose the pain of perseverance or the pain of regret? Because when we give up the process, when we hit the eject button, when we abort it, say, God, this is too painful. It's too hard. I can't do it. That's when the pain of regret comes in. I don't know about you, but I don't wanna to get to the end of my life and be ready to pass from this into the next kingdom. You understand that we are people in process and true perfection will only come someday. The Bible says that when we pass from this life to the next, that we will become like him. We'll be complete, we'll become perfect. But until that time, I'm gonna to continue to persevere Believing the promises that God has spoken over my life. Believing the promises he's spoken over my marriage. Believing the promises he's spoken over my family. And I will not give up. No matter how bad things might get, no matter how hard, no matter when there was days where I just wanted to throw in the towel and say, God, I'm done. You could take this ministry, you could take this church. I'm out, don't want it. It's too painful, God but then he would remind me, I'm with you. Though you may walk through the shadow, 
of the valley of death. I'm right there with you. His rod and his staff, they, they comfort me. Yeah, I'm going through it. I don't know when this is gonna end. I don't know if I'm gonna make it to the other side, but I know that he's with me right now. And in the middle of my enemies, he's preparing a table and he's inviting me to sit down, just sit a while, just be with me. Don't be in a hurry. Man, we need to give God more time to work. I'm gonna, last point, I'm gonna give it to you and then I'm gonna wrap this up because I need to. The last point is this, that we need to choose discipline of ourself. I like uh, Mark Batterson, is one of my favorite authors and, and he says, we have to get really good at making decisions against ourself. Yourself is your soul, it's your, it's your will, it's your mind, your will, your emotions. Here's the problem with emotions. Emotions are fleeting and they're fickle. And too many of us, we allow our emotions to tell our souls what to do instead of us, just like David. He would have to constantly, you read the Psalms and you could hear this. He's fighting inside with, man, I've got all these emotions. I'm mad at you, God, like, where are you? Why are you letting this happen? Talk about somebody who had a promise on his life. You're gonna be king, you're anointed. I mean, through the whole process, you're anointed, but not yet. 12 years, he went through the pain of running through his life and trying to trust God and hang on to his word and believe God's word was true, right? And he had to discipline himself to fight, to stay in that place. Check this out. Discipline is choosing what you want most over what you want now. And Paul said, everything is permissible for me. Like I can do a lot of things, but not everything is beneficial. So I can choose something that can might be good for me, but it may not be the best thing for me. Your feelings will try to get you to do what you want now, but you get to choose. You only get to direct your will. It's an act of your will. It's an act of your soul to say, God, I'm choosing to align my will with your will. I like this quote. Um, it says this, pray like it all depends on you and work like it all depends on God. Like I'm gonna pray and trust God but I'm gonna work like it all depends on me. This is choosing faith over my feelings because my feelings will try to get me to quit, try to get me to stop. But David learned an important truth. You need to learn to strengthen yourself in the Lord. At a time when David was ready, he was distressed, he was ready to throw in the towel, ready to give up. It says in 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse six, but David was greatly distressed. Listen to this. The souls of them were all bitterly grieved, each man for his own sons and daughters. But, but David encouraged and strengthened himself in the Lord his God. How many times would David say, he'd go on a rant, he'd, he knew what he was feeling, he was in touch with his feelings, he didn't deny the reality, this is how I'm feeling, God. But David, I'm gonna preach to my soul I'm gonna command my soul. This is what we have to understand. You are in control of your will. Your feelings, don't be led by your feelings, be led by the Spirit of God, and you get to decide what you will do. David would say, man, I'm going through this, but put your hope in the Lord, soul. I will trust in the Lord, soul. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. I'm in the middle of it, but I choose to praise him. I'm going through it, but I choose to trust him. I don't know how this ends, but I choose to put my hope in him. At the end of your willpower is God's power, right? I love this quote. If you can just, um, I, I'll say that one. Okay, real quick. Your willpower will only get you so far, but when you add God's power to your will power, impossible becomes impossible. Impossible becomes possible. I messed that up. You got it. Write it down. Take a picture. I'm trying to get through this quick. This is good stuff though. I'm going to end with this. Um, the San Antonio Spurs, 
in their championship run, if you're a basketball fan, you remember when they have big old Dave, uh, what was his name? The Navy guy. Dave Robinson, thank you. And um, the French guy, anyway. They they had this amazing run, championship team, and they had this quote from Jacob Rills. and, And the quote went like this. When nothing seems to help, I go and look at the stone cutter hammering away at his rock, perhaps a hundred times without as much as a crack showing in it. Yet at the hundredth and first blow, it will split in two. And I know it was not just the last blow that did it, but all that had gone before. Hope Church, can I tell you something? That if you continue to trust God, choose faith over feelings choose to strengthen yourself in the Lord choose to yield your will to his will not my will but yours be done every time you do it you're chipping away like a hammer on that thing until all of a sudden this is how breakthrough happens not in a moment but in all the moments that you chose to stay in the middle, stay in trusting God, choosing to trust him. And this is the result. James 1, 12, you can dim the lights. I'm about done. Blessed is the one. Listen to this. Let this sink into your heart this morning. Then we're going to have the worship team's going to lead us in a final song. And we're going to have some of our prayer team that that got trained this weekend. They're going to be up here at the front, ready to pray for you. I believe there's some of you that are here and you are maybe this close to giving up. Maybe there's some of you that have given up. Maybe you're in the middle of discouragement. You're going through some trials and God gave me this message and you're here this morning. Maybe you're joining us online or in Eureka and God put this message on my heart to remind you this thing called perseverance. James said, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test That person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Come on, would you stand with me? Put your hand on your heart as you stand. Come on, lift one hand to heaven, put one hand on your heart. Right now, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would touch every single person here. I pray that you would empower them. God, I pray for a fresh encounter with you, fresh encounter with your presence, that right now, God, you would strengthen the feeble knees. God, strengthen those whose strength is failing. I pray that you would encourage those who are discouraged. God, I pray that those who came in this morning and they're barely hanging on, ready to throw in the towel, ready to give up. God, right now, by the power of your Holy Spirit, would you invade their heart and strengthen them in Jesus' name.